Hello and welcome to Noble Mind. Noble Mind is a podcast exploring mindfulness, meditation, and psychology. Hello, I'm Alex Gokcher. And I'm Dr. Kate King. In this episode, we talk to Charlotta Rotterdam about working with difficult emotions, compassion, and self-compassion through the lens of Buddhist practice. Charlotte Rotterdam is a Buddhist teacher, meditation instructor, and contemplative educator. She received the title of Magyu Lopen, lead teacher of the mother lineage at Tara Mandala by Lama Tsultrim Alioni in 2016. She is the director of the Center for the Advancement of Contemplative Education and an instructor at Naropa University. She also co-developed and teaches Naropa's Mindful Compassion Training. Charlotta holds a Master's in Theological Studies from Harvard Divinity School. You can learn more about Charlotta and join our email list at noblemindpodcast.com. We hope you find our conversation engaging and inspiring. Thank you for joining us, Charlotta. Would you tell our audience a little bit about yourself and your work? Yes. Well, first, thank you for having me on. My background is in the study of philosophy, initially Western philosophy, and then in graduate school in religious studies and in comparative religion. And my turn to religious studies from Western philosophy was really, I realized that I I love the deep questions of philosophy. You know, why are we here? What's the meaning of life? What does it mean to be a good person? Yet religion to me, studying religious traditions, was really about how people live those questions in their everyday life and not just thought about them conceptually, but how we hold those questions through rituals, through how we relate to each other in community, how we relate to land. I did a lot of work on the role of the environment and sacred land, sacred mountains specifically, in informing our relationship to the natural world and creating a sense of sacred world. So that was sort of the direction that I followed in my studies. And then I've been connected to working for and teaching at Naropa University here in Boulder, Colorado for the last 25 years. Naropa is a small liberal arts Buddhist inspired university. I teach at the undergraduate and graduate levels contemplative practice, contemplative studies, Buddhist psychology, meditation. I run a center for contemplative education there. And then I've also for the last 16 years have been connected to a Tibetan Buddhist Center in southwestern Colorado called Tara Mandala, which was founded by a Western woman teacher named Lama Tsultram Alioni. So I lived there for four years, and I teach as part of that in that lineage. So I teach there and really all around in the Buddhist tradition. Yeah, so that's a bit of my my path and my history. And I think what what drives my work and teaching is really this sense that We have profound inner resources, both in our own heart mind and also within what we might call the more spiritual dimensions of community to serve our world in really powerful ways. And particularly, you know, in these times more than ever, what does authentic, genuine action mean and look like from drawing off of this inner resource of what I consider our genuine, most authentic, deeply inspired heart. You mentioned graduate study and comparative religion, and I'm wondering whether you entered that academic study already with a spiritual practice or Buddhist path yourself, or did that develop later on or out of the academic journey? Yeah, my Buddhist practice developed really later when I came to Naropa University. And at that time, when I started my graduate studies, my own spiritual life was very much connected to land and nature. And I grew up in New York City, so it's kind of a strange thing. But I would find that in nature, something, you know, something bigger opened, some bigger sense of awareness of who we are, of what we're doing, and, and some way that the natural world holds us that is not as concerned about what my particular worry or obsession is in that moment. And there's some incredible relief in connecting in that way. So I think that was my first, my first spiritual teacher was the natural world. 
I can relate to that experience having, I, I didn't grow up in, in the city city, but in the suburbs where nature is very tamed and contained and very much landscaped, <laughs> you know, so then, you know, the times of being out in more wild nature has, has really been impactful for me too. And, and even in these recent months of spending so much time working from home, I find that going to the beach recently and just having a few minutes looking out at the sea and the ocean was really, really helpful for me. Absolutely. Looking at our world right now, and it's a privilege to be able to go into wild wilderness. And so then even in the city of finding those ways that we can connect Sometimes it's just about looking up at the sky. In Manhattan, it's like the sky is kind of narrow, but it's still the big open sky. Or you see the squirrel running up the tree, and there's that little bit of that wildness right there in the middle of the city. So I do think we can find it anywhere. And then those beautiful moments of getting to see the open sea or see a mountain, that's obviously a particular blessing. Did you find Buddhist teachings offer an easier access to nature? In terms of the Buddhist tradition and the connection to nature, it's an interesting question. I haven't actually contemplated it so much, but there's something around space that connects both of them to me. And this sense that we or I, I'll speak from my own experience, through my Buddhist practice and through my experiences in the natural world, I'm opened, as I was saying before, to something vaster. But there's a connection to a space or a sense of spaciousness that holds everything that's arising. And so I'm not as much having to parse out what's in and what's out and what's right and what's wrong and what's part of my life and what shouldn't be part of my life, but actually beginning to connect with the openness or the vastness that's holding the totality. And so I think that's one thing that has really drawn me to the Buddhist path, certainly that I see in the natural world as, as awakening that awareness as well. And I suspect this approach also connects with your interest in compassion and self-compassion. You direct Naropa's Compassion Initiative and you're involved in their Mindful Compassion Training Program. So I wonder if you could share with us your view of compassion and self-compassion. Thank you. Yeah, the compassion training program at Naropa, which we co-developed, there were seven of us faculty who co-developed it over a period of two years, a number of years ago, maybe four or five years ago. And in some ways, it grew out of, one, a realization that the core of all of Naropa's contemplative education was the vision or the appreciation valuing of compassion as an inherent quality of human beingness and that cultivating that was really a gift that we could offer ourselves and all of our students as our students go out into the world regardless of what particular field they they work in and it also came in a way on the wave of mindfulness so the mindfulness movement which we can love and we can hate and we can criticize it's all in there of course like with all good things but mindfulness opens us. Mindfulness has a sense of expanding our awareness. I think of mindfulness as a practice of disruption, actually, disrupting our habitual patterns, either of thinking or of seeing or of understanding the world and ourselves in a certain way, and cracking open those habitual patterns so that we witness, we acknowledge something else. But then what do we do? What happens as we open in that way? is what we're doing is really we're opening the doors to compassion and compassion being that place of connecting deeply, connecting deeply with ourselves and with other beings, human, non-human beings. And so that compassion, when we talk about compassion and we teach compassion, we talk about three elements of compassion. One is mindfulness or awareness, actually seeing clearly what's going on in a situation. And the second is feeling into it, being willing to be moved by it, be impacted by it, actually 
feel our heart mind opening in some way, leaning into it. And then the third part is a response that compassion always involves a response of some kind. And that could be on a whole spectrum of action. In this sort of awakening of mindful compassion, I think what we tap into is a sense of our profound interdependence and interconnectedness with each other. There's never an out. We can't get out of being in relation to other beings. Even solitude is a form of relationship to other beings. And even when you're in solitude, suddenly the insect world gets very alive. So we're actually always in relationship. And it's really a felt experience of interdependence then opens us to compassion for other and for ourselves. Because really, self and other from this view are a continuum. There's no separate self over here and then other over there. Certainly, there's a difference in focus, but I like to think of them as a continuum. I often like to think in images. I'm like, what's the good image for self, other, compassion? So on one side, you could see it as an arc, but I almost would rather see it as a spiral or as a circle of some kind that you can enter at any point. In other words, for some people, it's easier to enter compassion through compassion for others. They see someone else's suffering. They respond to that suffering. They do what they can to alleviate that suffering. For others... Particularly, let's say you're working with some deep trauma that's come up for you. It might be good to start with yourself and to begin to really look at what is my own pain? What is my own suffering? And how can I be with that? How can I feel into it? How can I hold it gently so that it can actually heal? But necessarily, I think when we have compassion for ourselves, when our hearts begin to crack open in being really honestly and genuinely with our own experience, we necessarily begin to open to the suffering of others who maybe are suffering in similar ways as we are, or who maybe are helpers, guides to us, supporters for us, and our heart naturally opens to them. And in the same way with self-compassion for other, I think at some point, if we only have compassion for others and not for ourselves, this is where we get to what is often called burnout, empathy burnout, the caretaker syndrome. I'm going to take care of everyone else, but not of me. And it's not sustainable. It's wonderful. We have so many beautiful helpers in the world, but If we burn ourselves out in that way, then we can't maintain and we're not coming from a place of wholeness. And how do you go about teaching compassion and self-compassion at Naropa? And we begin with mindfulness, actually. We begin with awareness because to actually be compassionate, to try to relieve suffering, we actually have to be aware of suffering. So all compassion begins with awareness. And sometimes... Honestly, that can be the hardest part. If we're speaking of self-compassion, for example, what that's calling me to do is to look at where am I wounded? Where am I hurt? Where is my heart broken? Where am I the most raw, the most tender? I talk about the courage of compassion. Of course, in French, heart is cœur. So courage to have heart, courage to look at, to really acknowledge where our suffering is. And the little aside here, the Buddha taught the Four Noble Truths. And the first noble truth is the truth of suffering. And I've often thought, you know, this is really bad marketing for a religious <laughs> tradition, right? To start with suffering. But it's that entry point. It's that we begin when we turn towards our suffering and acknowledge it. That's the beginning. So when we cultivate, when we train compassion, self-compassion or other compassion, it really begins with that awareness of where our suffering is. And then developing the capacity to actually be with it, to actually feel into it. Trunk Rinpoche, who founded Naropa, he talks about the genuine heart of sadness, this tender and raw heart. He calls it the soft spot our willingness to feel into the soft spot where we are moved and it's where the world touches us. You know, in terms of the training, then we very gently begin to develop. We teach loving kindness practice, which is a very ancient practice of 
basically wishing yourself well. What would you wish yourself if you could wish yourself the most complete life, the happiest life? You would wish safety for yourself. You would wish health for yourself, mental happiness, ease of being. So those are some simple practices that we teach and cultivate, and it's practice. I think we do it in every moment and probably till the moment we die. One thing I really value about the way Naropa teaches is a very experientially focused. It's not just like a lecture on the theory of compassion and various historical or religious traditions. It's actually like, let's do some practice. I remember when I first encountered that, which was when I was in high school and I got my hands on the first Buddhist text that I found. And I remember feeling like, really validated. All life is suffering. And I was like, exactly. (laughs) I knew it. Someone gets it. (laughs) Also, I was thinking as you were talking about compassion for others and or just compassion generally starting with awareness, because I think that's something that we're seeing in the world these days too, is people becoming a lot more aware of suffering, aware of racial injustice and aware of disproportionate access to health care and the ways that systems kind of intersect. And, and that awareness has thankfully led, led a lot of people to care and want to try to do something different. Yes, definitely. And I think what it brings up for me is also where compassion can get a little stuck sometimes in that sometimes I think we can think that compassion is trying to fix a problem or compassion can go into pity And that both of those are actually based on a kind of almost non-willingness to be with the suffering that we are seeing or that we feel. And it can be very uncomfortable, obviously, to be with suffering, our own, or when we're genuinely feeling the suffering of another. And so that attempt to fix very quickly, to just make it go away, As good as it may seem on the intention side, I think being on the receiving side, we can feel that. If someone's trying to just make the suffering go away so that they feel better, I hope you feel better so I can feel better. And something's not genuine in that. As a mother, I've realized this with my kids, wanting to just give them the quick fix. Oh, I'll just make you your favorite snack or your favorite dessert, and then you'll be happy. And then realizing... Well, actually, what you need right now is you're just crying because it's the nature of being alive, and all you need is for me to hold you right now. And my action, my compassionate action, is actually holding you and being with you in your place of not knowing or having lost a friend or having had a fight with a friend or whatever it is. And then the pity piece, It's so dualizing. Oh, those people over there, or you poor thing, I have such pity for you. And it separates us. It's not a willingness to actually be with the suffering of another. So I think, especially in these times, how can we hold the intensity of the questions that are coming up and the injustice that's more and more right in our eyes and our faces that has always been there? And some have been privileged to feel it seemingly less than others. But here it is coming to the fore. And how do we stay with it with eyes open and heart open without either making it someone else's problem, that sort of pity side of things, or just trying to fix it to make it go away and not feel bad, but actually live right now in the openness and the rawness of it. At least for me, that's that edge, which I think compassion calls us to. What would you say are compelling reasons to engage in self-compassion? I suspect the culture at large has many misunderstandings about it. You know, I've been thinking a lot about this notion of self, and obviously from the Buddhist standpoint, so many teachings on no self. You know, the the one kind of bashing that's totally okay is ego bashing, right? (laughs) Mm. And they're like, well, that's not quite it either entirely. So what is the self that ultimately, again, from this viewpoint of radical interdependence and interconnectedness, the self is like our little corner of the ocean of totality. And just like the ocean has no corners, there's ultimately no separation. But it's almost like if you're a scientist and you want to test the water, 
you don't test every single piece of the water. You take a sample and then you test and you get a sense of the whole. And so in some ways, if we can consider ourselves that pocket, that corner of the ocean of the universe, can we come to know it intimately so that in some way we can come to know other beings intimately? And so I would say this practice of self-compassion is one coming to truly know what is this being that is this me, this pocket of the universe. And in traditional teachings, there's no separation between self-compassion and other compassion. I was at a conference once and someone said, well, actually self-compassion doesn't really exist. Compassion is always for other, and to talk about self-compassion is really to fall into the trap of self and other dualism. And so, yes, at one level, obviously, that's true. But Western culture is individualistic. We do live in dualities of self and other, and so to ignore that seems not quite right either. So how could we actually use our over-identification with self as a way in to develop compassion. And interestingly enough, the kind of self-inflation that comes a lot in Western culture, also on the other side of the coin is this self-denigration. So there's this pride on one hand, arrogance on the one side, and on the other hand, a kind of, I am all bad. I am evil. I am not good enough. I'm not kind enough. No one will ever love me. All, we have so many, so much pain in the self. And so to actually go in what compassion is to bring space to that, to actually create, it's almost like a basket or place where whatever is arising for us within us can be there, including our not knowing, including our pain, including our anger, including our hurt. And Framing it as within this continuum or this circle of self-other dance, self-compassion is important and can be a very important way in. And maybe I can say just a few words what it's not. Sure. It's not self-involvement. Sometimes there can be a fear that self-compassion is just feeling sorry for myself all the time, just getting even more caught in my own story. But it's not that. It's not self-involvement. It's actually looking clearly at what my experience is and not winding so tightly around it. It's also not about self-esteem, arrogance and self-denigration. So in the same way, self-compassion is neither self-involvement, nor is it trying to build up a lot of self-esteem because self-esteem is based on accomplishment what I've accomplished, what I can check off a list, what I can show you I've done. And self-compassion is actually an appreciation and an acknowledgement of ourselves over and above or before anything we've accomplished, regardless of what we've done. Lama Sultram talks about primordial self-esteem, meaning not the self-esteem that's built on something, but I am good enough because I am. And just beingness is worthiness, is value. And so self-compassion is really our way into that, good enough as I am. That's very curious that Western culture, you're pointing out, both elevates the self and perhaps not spoken so much, also denigrates, attacks the self. That's very interesting. So you're saying self-compassion is a way around that illusion, perhaps. Yeah, or maybe using that because we've become so individually focused, that it's almost like, let's use that doorway and bring some insight and wisdom through that tunnel that we've carved deep into our cultural patterning. I had also encountered a teacher one time saying that a lot of people come into a Buddhist path liking this idea of no self, but largely coming out of a place of self-aggression, basically, a desire to get rid of this self that I hate so much, so that there's actually a step before the step of really contemplating the no self, which is having some kind of a healthy, I put in air quotes, but some other way of relating to the self that isn't just like, let's make it disappear because I don't like it. Yeah. And it's really coming into in the Buddhist teachings, this precious human body, in our case, human body, and the preciousness of life. And 
that great mystery that who knows why are we here and what are we doing and how long do we get to be in this life but that this this vehicle of self is the way that we experience our precious human life and the way we get to be with each other the way we get to love each other the way we get to love the world um, so it's not about getting rid of it but i would almost say coming to inhabit it more more fully i like that yeah i'm thinking about working with difficult emotions and i know that you've done some teaching uh, with lama sultram around feeding your demons and that I'd love to hear a little more about that because on you know, a little bit on the surface feeding your demon sounds like mm, that may not be a good idea. Yeah, I guess a few things, you know, in terms of working with difficult emotions and this goes back a little bit to our conversation around self-compassion and the sense of tapping into self as basically complete, basically whole, basically good even just as one is, as I am. And then what do we do when we have anger arise, when we have frustration arise, when we have irritation arise, or when we have whatever our difficult emotions might be. And so from within this view, and also this sense of interdependence or vastness, what we started with of the wilderness of the landscape, the vastness of mind, the vastness of awareness, or the vastness of, of our natural world, that everything's included. Everything has its place there. And the analogy I sometimes use for difficult emotions is it's like our trash. You know, I throw things away and then it's great. I put it in this white plastic bag and it has a red ribbon and I drive down my driveway and I put it in a dumpster and every Thursday, boom, it's gone. It's wonderful, <laughs> right? And then I start over and then I, my trash goes away. And as far as I know, it's gone, never to be seen again. But that view is dependent on some sense that my territory is quite limited, right? Here in my little territory of home, there's trash and then it goes away. But as I begin to expand my awareness or my territory, my sense of what's my place, very soon I begin to realize, while that trash isn't going away anywhere, mm -hmm. it's moving to a different location, I have a different relationship to it, but it's not gone, it's never gone. And so in the same way with our emotions, like oh, I just wish this feeling would go away or this habit I have would go away or this tendency I have, right? These are our demons. Our demons are those parts of ourselves that we disown in some way. In Jungian language, we might say the shadow. It's those parts of ourselves that we don't like. It's our trash, right? That's why I'm using this analogy. It's the parts we wish we could put in that white plastic bag, drive down the driveway, and Thursday afternoon, it, they'd be gone. But again, from this bigger view, they don't go anywhere. They're all part of us. So then from that view, if it's all part of us, if that inner trash, what we might want to throw away, we're always in relationship to it, then what do we want that relationship to be? How do we engage skillfully with those demons? And these teachings are based directly on 11th century teachings by a Tibetan yogini named Machig Labdran, and she developed a practice called Ch. C-H-O-D, with an umlaut on the O, which means uh, severance. Her teachings were about turning towards the demons and nourishing rather than fighting them. And so this is, as you said, question, why would I want to feed my demons? Isn't that the opposite? Wouldn't I want to starve <laughs> my demons? You know. But again, the view here is that the reason we consider our demons problematic is that we don't have what we might call right relationship with them. We haven't integrated them. We haven't found a way to compost our trash so that it can feed us. We're continuously trying to push it further out, sell it to another country or put it in the ocean. Mm -hmm. right. This metaphor is getting better I know, better right? Better. The trash. I know we're all <laughs> going to become deep environmentalists along the way here. <laughs> so the invitation then that Machik made, and then this work that Lama Tsultrim developed, which is called Feeding Your Demons, which is a five-step process that's also influenced by Gestalt psychology, 
where we actually externalize the demon, we visualize it as a being, and then we enter into relationship with it, we ask it questions. And we ask it fundamentally, what does it really need? And the view here is again that our demons are parts of ourselves, they're telling us something and we're not listening. That's a part of ourselves that's not fully being nourished, that's not fully being listened to. And so rather than pushing it away, we turn towards it, we acknowledge it. And in this process, we literally ask it, what do you really need? How will you feel when you really get what you need? And then in the process itself, we do a visualization of dissolving our body into a nectar that feeds the demon what it truly needs and watch it transform, watch it actually be nourished. And that sense of our wholeness, that our demons are parts of the whole that have remained undernourished, actually. And so by turning towards them with compassion, this is fundamentally a compassion practice, that there's insight and there's wisdom that can actually arise out of those parts of ourselves, which we have cut off. I would love to, if you can think of an example to help bring this home, I think that would be helpful. Maybe I'm thinking some of the classic demons like the inner critic or maybe an emotion that feels unwelcome like anger or yeah, something so like anger that. is a great one because we've been taught anger is not a virtue right <laughs> anger doesn't get on that list it's just about <laughs> i don't know any tradition and yet who hasn't experienced anger it's part of the human repertoire of our emotional experience so what do we do with it Again, do we send it out into space? Do we just put up with it? Do we squelch it? I think we've all developed mechanisms of how to be with it in some way. So if we look at anger, like just feeling into anger, it's actually incredible energy. When you're angry, are you sleepy? Are you about to doze out? Are you spaced out? No image that comes to me sometimes is if you could plug us in, it's like plugging into high voltage anger. It's mm -hmm. moving through your body. There's cold anger and there's hot anger, the cold anger of sort of that cold shoulder. And, but there's still, there's a lot of strength in that. And then there's the hot anger, mm -hmm. which is rage, incredible fire moving through the body. With this feeding your demons paradigm, it's to say, okay, Turn towards the anger. What is in that anger? Let me go into feeling this. This technique of working with emotion is shared by many traditions and deep within contemplative practice as well. But of actually turning towards that feeling, letting the story go a little bit, because generally our emotions are connected with all kinds of bubbles of storylines. So coming into the felt experience, the felt experience of anger of incredible energy, incredible vibrancy, and really what's at the heart of it? And I would say often at the heart of anger is we care deeply. We care deeply about something. And so right in the middle of anger is an open heart, is actually a profound connection and caring and love even of something that's inspiring us. Alex, are you about to say something? <laughs> Just I'm touched by the positive qualities you're ascribing yeah, to anger. And it is good in the sense of the things you're angry about. What do you care? What do you love in this world? And for each of us, that's going to be different. But so if we can tap into that inner voice of anger, you might say, then the question is, okay, what do I do with all this energy? What do I do with having just plugged into maximum voltage? In the Buddhist tradition, anger is connected with clarity, with mirror-like wisdom. The image or metaphor I sometimes use is a sharp knife. Sometimes people have that who see clearly. Our anger, when it's clear, when it's actually responding rather than reactive, when it's coming from a place of centeredness, can actually cut through a lot of confusion, can cut through a kind of stuckness. It's like a room of people talking and fighting and, and it's just stuffy. 
And then someone comes in with this blade of clarity and says it like it is. And it's almost this freedom that comes from that. Almost this, yes, finally, someone said it. And we all breathe more easily. So just to be very specific, bring it to the ground. Being a mother, anger, when is that no the most compassionate thing? As opposed to, oh, sweetie, it would be so nice if you didn't this, that, or the other. I mean, the classic example is the kid running across the street. And you're not going to soft talk your kid not into running across the busy street. You're going to say that no. It's actually deeply compassionate. It can be. It has that potential. When I think about my own anger, I think, yeah, okay, like I can see that. And then, but seeing other people's anger sometimes is harder, especially if we've been on the receiving end of mistreatment. Absolutely. And this is where I think coming back to our conversation around self-compassion and your question, Alex, you know, why, why cultivate self-compassion? I think this is also why it's so important because when we begin to understand, let's say, anger, our own anger and where it comes from, then when we see it expressed not so skillfully by others when we're on the receiving end, maybe there's some piece of ourselves that can say, huh, I wonder if they're having that experience that I had when I look at my own anger. And so our practice of self-compassion is actually a way to potentially connect with others when they're not showing up in their best way. So very, very important. And the other thing I want to say in terms of your reflection here, Kate, on being on the receiving side of anger is Another misunderstanding of compassion is that it's always sweet and kind and nice. Yes, kind. I'll keep kind in there. But I don't think compassion is always sweet or nice. I think there's also fierce compassion. And again, in the Buddhist tradition, there are these wonderful examples and metaphors and beings who represent fierce compassion. And that compassion, when it draws into that energy that I was talking about in terms of anger, is incredibly skillful and it has a fierceness to it. And so sometimes when we are on the receiving end of unskillful anger, maybe fierce compassion is absolutely called for and not a kind of kitten. Well, kittens actually can be quite fierce. So that's probably not a good metaphor, right? They'll <laughs> scratch you as soon as look at you. But, um, you know, it's not the sort of lie down and show my belly kind of compassion. It's we can rise up to meet that. And how does one distinguish between this wisdom that can be in anger versus destructive, mindless anger? I don't think there's an easy answer. I do think this is where compassion is an ongoing practice of wakefulness. That's why I think so many traditions have said, just don't use anger. Don't use that knife in your tool belt because it is so sharp you could probably use a duller knife to do almost anything. So just leave that one to the side. But when we use it, there's incredible wakefulness and incredible honesty that we have to have with ourselves to know from where is this fierce compassion or where is this wise anger actually coming from? And in some ways, no one can tell us that except ourselves. So being able to really hone into, do I have another agenda going on here? Am I triggered? And I'm actually like a wounded animal lashing out, but I'm calling it wise anger. This is where some of the subtlety I think we have to feel out for ourselves. And then obviously we have to look at the impact. We might think that our anger came from wisdom, but if we see that the impact it had on others was destructive, then no matter how wise we might have thought it was, it probably wasn't helpful. And so compassion is also then looking at what is our impact in the short term, in the long term, and being willing to listen. We've probably all done a lot of things we thought were good that if we had a good enough friend, I had a very good friend who said to me once, you know, I know you were trying to be helpful, but it felt like you were pitying me. And it was some of the most helpful feedback I got because I really was trying to help, but it was from the wrong place. So to be able to get that feedback and listen is, I think, part of being able to distinguish these types of anger as well. I'm also thinking if I'm on the receiving end of someone's anger, that it's, it's easy to just sort of reject 
whatever the message is, because I don't like the delivery. And again, I feel like we're seeing this in the world a bit now too. Sometimes we feel justified in rejecting a message because of the way it's being shared with us. And so if it has anger in it, we feel justified in throwing out the entire message and to be wary of that, that sometimes anger is exactly the vehicle that's needed because it's a swift and powerful vehicle to deliver a message and that we not confuse the message with the vehicle. I was also thinking some of what you're talking about from these feeding your demons teachings are connected to paintings in Tibetan Buddhism of protector deities with sword blades and heads cut off and stomping on babies and all kinds of symbolism there, but they look very aggressive from the outside. For a while, I taught a kid's sangha. And so we would, there are all these wonderful stories from the Buddhist tradition and we do simple practices and so forth. And then I teach them about the protectors. And I'd say, if you had your own personal protector, would you want it to be, here the kitten comes in, would you want it to be a sweet little kitten or would you want it to be a big monster with serpents coming out of its head and swords and multiple heads and they, oh, that one, I'll take that one. Right. So it is that, you know, what is it in us that, that power, you know, the power of the fierce, because it's again, what do you love and what are you willing to stand up to? Again, it has this mother energy. What do I take care of? Because I love it so fiercely and not in spite of anyone or anything, but because love is actually incredibly powerful. Mm -hmm. And so I think we're able to actually weave those two together. And the protector images you're talking about, Kate, I think do that. They're protecting out of deep love, not aggression in the sense You've shared a few examples about parenting and being with children. Do you ever have them draw their protectors? Because that sounds like that would be fun. (laughs) We do, actually. And in the demon feeding process, I talked a little bit about externalizing the demon and this conversation we have with the demon. And then we become the demon, actually, and answer those questions as the demon of what it really needs. And then we feed it. And then after the feeding of the demon, when the demon is completely satisfied, there's an ally that arises and either sometimes the demon transforms into an ally or we invite an ally to appear. And that's really this protector energy. And it's our own inner wisdom that is connected to, like we've been talking about anger. What is that wisdom? What is that insight that is held within this intensity? And then the ally speaks to us. And it's a wonderful process because it's then this, our own inner wisdom speaking to ourselves. And so, yes, then the kids, even adults, we get to draw our demons and we draw our allies. And there's something wonderful in actually giving visual representation to a felt experience to this visualization. So. Yeah, there's some great drawings that come out of it. (laughs) And if people are interested in doing this practice or these practices, how would they go about that? Yeah, so Lama Sultram wrote a wonderful book called Feeding Your Demons, Lama Sultram Alioni. And I teach this work. It's taught through Tara Mandala, the retreat center. So we have a whole year-long certificate program that we also are teaching online now where you can become certified to become a facilitator in the process. All of that is through Tara Mandala and taramandala.org. So one can look there Mm. for further information. So is it the same five steps regarding all different emotions, sort of a protocol? Yes, it's the same process. And then you work with whatever demon is most alive for you. Mm. In that moment, we have the sort of little demons of that phone call I had an hour ago. And then there's the demon you've known since you were a little kid, the one that's been following you. And so whatever you want to bring into the process, you work with that. And you always work with your own relationship to it. And since we've been talking a lot about others, even of anger of others, the demon isn't someone else's anger but it's your feeling of what they triggered in you, let's say, Mm -hmm. that you work with. Because that's, again, the place of agency and compassion. I didn't talk about this so much, but compassion is having deep agency, really stepping into our center and our ability to respond to suffering 
however we see it. So in this process of working with our demons, we're always working with my feeling about a situation or my feeling about a relationship or my feeling about another person. And we also work with collective demons, whether that's through our cultural heritage, our racial heritage, our societal heritage. We embody those and we hold them and often we're the ones carrying them forward as well. So we work with those as well. That sounds really meaningful. So not just tuning into the individual demons that you might have in your own life, but also thinking about societal or cultural level demons. And of course, I'm thinking about things like structural racism or things that you don't want to believe are there. Absolutely. And it begins with awareness. A lot of our demons, we don't even see them. We don't want to see them. This is the privilege not to be aware of something often. So turning towards and really becoming clear of what the demons are that we hold at a personal level and as a representative of of society, of the society we live in. So it's a deep, deep looking within. So how might people work with something like prejudice? Or is that too big a question? No, it's wonderful. There's many layers to this, I would say. So one is, again, beginning with oneself. This is, again, the courage to admit my own prejudice, to admit my own racism. That's the starting point. Mm. Prejudice isn't out there. It's right here. And so I begin, let's say, with the demon feeding process, maybe with my unwillingness to see my prejudice. You know, I'm not prejudiced. That could be the demon of avoidance, of not seeing. So that might be a starting place. Or maybe I realized, well, I felt some prejudice in that moment in the grocery store. And it's very specific and nothing really happened, but I begin there. Anything becomes a portal into something vaster. And then, of course, I can work with being a white woman. I might say, okay, well, wow, I feel guilt or I feel shame. Then I work with that. So what's my genuine experience of something that's much vaster in our culture? So that's at the individual level. And we've been doing this work. It's very much in development, but doing collective demon feeding. So we have a circle. We just did this recently in a training. So we had, I guess there were about 20 of us. And we did a collective demon feeding around racism. And so everyone did their own process around how they see this demon of racism in their own experience. But then when we got to the point of speaking as the ally, I talked about at the end of the process, we become a a sort of wisdom being. Then we all spoke into the center of our circle from that place of wisdom around this issue. And it's quite amazing what comes out in that process because it's obviously it's individual and yet it's almost like spokes of a wheel of the whole speaking to something that we each are a part of. We are all a part of and we also have our perspective on or can contribute to that whole view. So that's another aspect of the work. It's very much in development. I wonder if you could say a few more things about the agency piece. Wondered how it works into feeding demons, or is it just about compassion? No, it was about anger too, I think. Yeah, I think it's connected to all of it. There's a lot of compassion research happening in neuroscientific fields and the difference between empathy and compassion. Mm. And the primary difference is that compassion really taps into the field of interdependence and interconnectedness and into agency. In other words, maybe to put it simply is when we realize that the world moves us, that we can be moved by things, it's a two-way street. I'm moved by something, which means I can move that the other way as well. In other words, I'm always in relationship, radical relationality. And what that means is agency is actually radical responsibility. I'm always a player in the game. There's no out. There's no pause button. There's no exit strategy. There's no back door. We are always in 
this play that is life, including in its suffering and including in its beauty. And so agency and compassion is actually that recognition that what I do matters. And actually, I'm always doing something. I'm always mattering, so to speak. My silence is a doing. My non-doing is a doing. My action is a doing. My word is a doing. And so that agency, it's both, it's wonderful. It's empowering. Yes, we can actually affect change from wherever we sit. And it's incredible responsibility. It's like the fire is always burning under our seat. It's very rich stuff. Yeah. <laughs> it is. It's called life. It's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> well, this has been a wonderful conversation. Where can people engage with you more, your teachings more, these teachings more, you know, resources you'd like to share or next steps for people who might be stimulated by this conversation? We've touched on a number of the areas of my involvement, so I'll just give you some information on all of those. So Naropa's compassion training, if you go to naropa.edu forward slash case, which is C-A-C-E, and that's our Center for Contemplative Education. There you'll find the Compassion Initiative and our Compassion Training programs. And our Compassion Training is also offered online through mindful.org. So it's called WELCOME is the acronym, WELCOME Mindful Compassion Training. So that's online as an evergreen course, so you could take that anytime. And then Tara Mandala is where you find information about feeding your demons. So that's Tara Mandala, all A's, dot org. And the book Feeding Your Demons, as I mentioned. And then my own website is skymind.us. That's where teachings and we have a regular sangha and blogs and so forth can be found as well. Love it. Thank you so much. This has been lovely. I really appreciate your time and your depth of your responses in our conversation. Yes. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Kate. Such beautiful work you're doing. Thank you for the investigations and inquiries you're bringing into our world. Thank you, Charlotte. Thanks for listening today. If you enjoyed this episode, we hope you'll hit subscribe, leave us a great rating or review and spread the word. You can also go to noblemindpodcast.com to join our email list you'll get a weekly behind-the-scenes message, news announcements, and other special goodies we come up with just for you. Thanks for listening, and bye for now.